Cameron is currently president of the Royal United Services Institute and co-chaired its signature event, the 2016 Strategic Studies Conference, held earlier this year in Vancouver. He holds rank of honorary major with the BC Regiment, DCO, and is member of the regiment's commanding officers committee. Earlier in his life, he was a reservist with the Royal Canadian Artillery. So with that impressive biography, please join me in welcoming Cameron Cathcart for his talk titled, Tragic Bravery, Canada and the Battle of Hong Kong. Thank you very much, Hugh. Yeah, uh, sometimes in our business, it's difficult to keep a job, right? <laughs> I appreciate you all being here. So many people I know are sitting around, uh, and I wanted to particularly uh, recognize Dr. Wallace Chung. Dr. Chung is a gentleman with tremendous uh, roots, shall we say, in British Columbia. And at the bottom of this building, in the basement area of this building, there's a marvelous collection. It's called the Chung Collection. And it is a collection of memorabilia and artifacts uh, of the Canadian Pacific Railway. And it is one of the uh, diamonds, in my view. It's a jewel in the crown, shall we say, uh, of, the, uh, of this particular institution, the Irving K. Barber Learning Center. So if any of you would like to see it, please uh, do so. You have to make sure that you're there when, the, when your uh, office is open. Uh, but uh, they do welcome guests, and uh, you, you'd love it. Thank you very much for your contribution, Dr. Chung. Uh, Julie Mitchell, thank you so much. Very, uh, very important. <laughs> um, Chelsea Shriver is the person that I've been dealing with here, and she's just a marvelous woman, and uh, thank you very much for all your help. Now, my presentation today is based on the fact that this, 2016 is the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Hong Kong. And it's, a, it's an incident, an event that is often forgotten in the memory of most Canadians, I would say. The, the demographic we're seeing in this room today probably does know all about the Battle of Hong Kong. But there are young people, of course, who don't or they haven't been made aware of it. And that's fine, because it has to, it's a learning process. But we want to talk about the tragedy of the Battle of Hong Kong. It was tragic for several reasons. One, uh, a misdirected decision, if you will, on the part of the federal government of Canada to, first of all, send people over there. Second of all, uh, they weren't very well equipped. And uh, in seven days, they were essentially defeated. And uh, you could say that the whole of the battle was a total disaster because either you were killed on the battlefield, you were wounded, or you were captured after the surrender, because the surrender occurred on the 25th of December, 1941, which was Christmas Day. Their struggle didn't end there because nearly four years later, they were all liberated because at that time they were prisoners of war, the Japanese. And it was a very, very difficult time for all those men. And so we'll get into that right now. There's a few, there's a story in here too that is a personal one, because I had a, a distant relative who was involved, so we'll talk about that. And I'd like to acknowledge the resources, which I will do at the very end of my talk. Well, this is Hong Kong today. Population, seven and a half million, growing steadily. Uh, dramatic change in the skyline, of course, in the past 75 years. Britain handed over this colony to China in 1997. Now there's Hong Kong in, uh, well, I guess 75 years ago. Um, the sharp contrast, as you can see. Uh, begun as a colony in 1841, nearly 100 years, well, it was 100 years before this, and it was acquired by the British after the famous Opium Wars. Now, in the late 1930s, Hong Kong was an important trading and military outpost of the British Empire in Asia. In the late 1930s, Hong Kong, as you say, was an a outpost. The population numbered about 1.6 million, and half of them were recent refugees from the mainland China 
they were escaping the Japanese, who had at that time already invaded China in 1936. Now, the colony itself extended from the island of Hong Kong, uh, right here, and north into Kowloon, up through the new territories with, uh, to the border with China. So it was a fair, a fair uh, and, and of course, Lanto Island and all the, Lama Island, all these islands were part of the British colony. Hong Kong's defenses were very, very weak. And I must say that there was also a very dismissive attitude among Western powers, especially the British, about Japan's fighting capabilities. Surprising, because Japan, as I mentioned, had already invaded China in 1936, and up to 30,000 troops were, were stationed right here, just on the other side of the border. And they were ready, ready to attack at any time. So the situation for Hong Kong was dire. Now, most of the colony's uh, defenses were pretty weak. And here we see uh, British soldiers uh, taking observations across the border into China, checking out on the Japanese. This is called the Gin Drinkers Line. I think they named the bay after the Gin Drinkers, and that's why they called it the Gin. I have a feeling they were drinking a lot of gin, too, because, well, I'll talk about that a little later. There is some stories about this. <laughs> um, so most of the col colony's defenses uh, were facing the south, that is, toward the South China Sea, wrong direction. Uh, spies in Hong Kong as well had been very, very busy uh, sending in information on various targets and the critical infrastructure uh, to the Japanese. Well, this man, when his military chief suggested beefing up Hong Kong's defenses, Winston Churchill predicted that if Japan decided to invade, British troops would, quote, not have the slightest chance. Now, that famous remark was prescient because we'll talk about that later. But Britain at the time was focused on its own survival as German bombs hammered that country. So the defense of uh, faraway Hong Kong at the edge of the empire was definitely not a priority. But in time, Churchill changed his mind when he was assured that a Canadian force may help the colony to survive. And this is the man who did it, Prime Minister Mackenzie King. His government wanted to get into the war and to support the old country, as it was known then. Canada had sent troops to the United Kingdom in 1939, but they were kind of sitting around. They were very impatient. They were waiting for action, no action. So in Ottawa, the military convinced the Prime Minister that Canada should and could help. Cabinet took five days. They took the fateful decision to help defend Hong Kong with Canadian troops. As we know now, they were being sent into a death trap. The Royal Rifles of Canada, stationed in Newfoundland at the time, had some training, had some training, and acquired this big Newfoundland dog as their mascot. He was called Sergeant Gander. Now sadly, poor old Sergeant Gander became a casualty himself. He bit into an enemy hand grenade, unfortunately, and that was the end of him. Meantime, the Winnipeg Grenadiers had been sent to tropical Jamaica. Who knew? Doing a lot of marching, but very little actual training. The two regiments now formed what was called Sea Force, a designation that meant troops are, quote, not ready for battle. Now, that categorization had a very ominous tone. With news that Canadian troops were to defend Hong Kong, the newspapers showed how mighty Canada would intimidate the Japanese army, as this jingoistic cartoon shows. But as we know as well, it didn't quite turn out that way. Troops essentially had no idea of where they were being sent. Chaotic planning and little preparation seemed to haunt the whole deployment. Eventually, though, Nearly 2,000 Canadian troops left Vancouver on October the 27th, 1941. Most were aboard this ship, the Awatea, a New Zealand liner seen here passing under Lionsgate Bridge. The story goes that because it was a New Zealand ship, the uh, 
the stores, the food was mainly mutton. <laughs> and uh, that didn't please the uh, Canadian Army too well, especially the soldiers. So uh, about, oh, about a third of the way through, they had almost a mutiny on board. They found some beef in the, uh, in the freezers, and they started serving beef. And the boys were a bit happier by that time. Smaller numbers left aboard HMCS Prince Robert. Now, this was one of three converted Canadian National BC Coastal Passenger Ships, which had been commandeered for service in the Royal Canadian Navy. They had two sister ships. One was the David and one was the Henry. Both of those ships were in the European theater. I'll just back up for a moment. Um, the Canadians arrived in Hong Kong aboard this ship and the Awatia, and wearing tropicals, they quickly make, began basic training. But here's the problem. Uh, delayed leaving Vancouver until November 6th was this ship called the San Jose. It was loaded with over 200 vehicles, munitions, and stores destined for the Canadians in Hong Kong. However, the ship was diverted to Manila, arriving there on December the 12th five days after the Japanese invaded Hong Kong itself. And the vital supplies destined for the Canadians ended up with the U.S. Army, who were fighting the Japanese in the Philippines. Here they are marching. Upon arrival, the Canadians marched through Hong Kong to salutes from the British military, civilian officials, and, of course, welcomed by the crowds there. Then it was steady, day-long training and taking up defensive positions in mountainous terrain above Hong Kong. You can see, for those of you who are aware of these kinds of, this is, a, this is known as a Bren gun. It's a very, a very effective machine gun, but they had very few of them, unfortunately. And, uh, and, the, and their supply of ammunition was always running low. It was one of the factors in their defeat, actually. Here's a, here's a gentleman, a lot of marching, as we said, a lot of marching. And as Grenadier Tom Forsyth wrote in his diary, we had a grueling session of drill under the lashing tongue of a lieutenant. Went to a movie after we saw The Long Voyage Home. Well, how, how ironic that would be. The... Uh, <clears throat> 14,000 troops in Hong Kong were commanded by British Major General, General Malt, Christopher Maltby. He's on the left, likely discussing strategy with the Canadian Brigadier John Lawson, who is commander of Sea Force. But on the December 8th, at 3.30 in the morning, the dam burst. The Japanese army poured into the new territories, attacking and overtaking the gin drinker's line. And here's the gin drinker's line right here. This, this, this defensive position is a long ways from the border with China. And the Royal Scots were on one side, the Punjab regiment on this in the middle, and the Rajputs on the right. So as you can see, there wasn't a lot of space between this line and Hong Kong Island itself. They poured, over the, uh, they poured over the line into the new territories. They attacked uh, uh, the Gin Drinkers Line, as I mentioned, and moved on to Kowloon. So the fate of Hong Kong essentially was sealed with this attack. The uh, Japanese Empire had launched the all-out war against the Western powers in Southeast Asia with coordinated attacks on Malaya, the Philippines, Guam and Pearl Harbor, all on December the 8th, which, because of the international dateline, Pearl Harbor was attacked on December the 7th, as we all know. And as FDR said, this was a day that would live in infamy. As the Japanese moved south, Kowloon was the next to fall. Here, crowds listened to the invaders from the loudspeakers. Now, our former Governor General, Adrian Clarkson, then Adrian Poi, was a child of two 
and lived in Kowloon at this particular time. She and her family uh, were able to leave the area in 1943, and they ultimately ended up in Ottawa. Now, again, we're looking at this map. The Grenadiers uh, were down in here on uh, the... Uh, they, were, they were on the left, and the right was the Royal Rifles. They were fully ensconced on the island of Hong Kong. The Grenadiers formed uh, part of the uh, West Brigade here, and the Royal Rifles, the East Brigade. Then at dusk on December the 18th, the Japanese crossed the harbor from Kowloon and attacked with four separate assaults. Here again, Tom Forsyth writing in his diary. We're at war with Japan. After breakfast, the sirens started to wail. Our parade square bombed, some Chinese killed, and several rifles wounded. The Japanese army began its invasion in Hong Kong Island after two demands for surrender were rejected by the British. The island was bombed and targets hit with heavy artillery from Kowloon. Once on shore, the invaders knocked out critical infrastructure such as this power plant over here on the left and quickly advanced up the mountain into the high ground. Having invaded China in 1936, the Japanese army was a tough and experienced fighting force determined to oust Western colonial powers from Asia. Now they were all well equipped too compared to the defenders hauling artillery up the mountainside and succeeding in taking the high ground. From Jardine's lookout, which is right here, we're looking down from Jardine's lookout, they overlooked Wong Chong Gap, a critical pass that split the island. They were tough fighters, but you know, they didn't count on the resistance of the Winnipeg Grenadiers, who inflicted severe casualties on the enemy delaying their push to the south by at least three days. This north-south road splitting Hong Kong runs through the gap from left on this picture to the right. There it is there, that's the main road. These, this is the police station at the time. This is the uh, headquarters for the Sea Force. And this is where uh, Brigadier Lawson was. And this is where, I'll tell you in a moment, he was killed and his body was found right there. This position right now <clears throat> is, um, is memorialized in Hong Kong. And uh, you, you, were, you were telling me that earlier on. And some of the company shel shelters were here. This is where the uh, Winnipeg Grenadiers were. And this is where they put up a lot of their defense against the Japanese. Now, with a sort of sad sense of foreboding, Tom Forsyth again turns to his diary. He says, I cannot bring myself to write what happened between the 18th and the 25th. All I can say is that I saw too many men, brave, brave men die. Some were my best friends, and they died beside me. Now, as this Canadian army map shows, which was drawn after the war, the Japanese moved fast and they took over half the island from December 19 to 20. You can see they came in through here. This is through, the Royal Rifles were mainly in through here, and they were in through here uh, in the, with the Grenadiers. Wong Chong Gap is right in here. Jardine's Lookout, right up there. So that picture we saw earlier, uh, that's where the, so, You've got to remember, and those of you who are very familiar with Hong Kong know that this is an incredibly mountainous island, and the, the, mountain, the, the mountain is very, very steep, and very difficult. Now, most of the fellows from Canada, well, the boys from Winnipeg were all from the prairies, and uh, the, the men from the Royal Rifles were essentially from uh, Quebec. Not too many mountains in either of those provinces. And so these boys had a tremendous amount of difficulty dealing with Japanese, but they were very, very tough fighters and extremely resilient, I must say. Um, the strategy by the Japanese was to split Hong Kong in two, dividing the defenders and, uh, you know, cutting their communication lines so they couldn't talk to each other, and driving them south 
this way toward the sea. And we'll see what happened there in a moment. December 19th was also a fateful day for the Grenadiers because that morning the Japanese, throwing hand grenades into the company's position, this man, most were tossed back by him, Sergeant Major John Osborne. He missed one, and to save his men, he was killed when throwing himself onto a grenade. Sergeant Osborne, who in those days was considered an old guy because he was over 40 years of age, uh, was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross for his courageous act, and it was the only VC awarded in the Battle of Hong Kong. This is a very famous picture. This has been seen many times, I know, but it's a good one because it gives you a good sense of the dynamic approach that the Japanese had. Late in the same morning, these men attacked Brigadier Lawson's headquarters. So he decided to withdraw, but it was too late. Surrounded, Lawson and his staff decided to fight it out. But moments later, he was cut down by a machine gun. They say that he came out with two Webleys in each end, but didn't do very much good against a machine gun. He was the highest ranking Canadian officer to be killed in the Second World War. And he's buried at Saiwan Bay Cemetery. The Japanese strategy to split Hong Kong Island was really working because by December 22nd, the defenders were running out of water, ammunition, food, and they really couldn't talk to each other anymore. Two days later, December 24, the Japanese made further gains on both the East and West Brigades. Time was moving very fast. On Christmas Day, the Japanese overran Allied positions, the white flag was hoisted, and that afternoon the governor surrendered. Here we see General Maltby right there, surrounded by top enemy brass, signing the surrender paper. It's interesting, these are candles. Because the uh, Japanese had knocked out all the power plants, they didn't have any electricity. So they signed the, the surrender in candlelight. How quaint. Here again is Tom Forsyth. When we heard of the surrender, men broke down and cried, asking, Surrender now? After all the good men that we've bounced? Stunned, dazed, apathetic, I never dreamed it could happen. Well, it did. <clears throat> and on the face of it, the takeover of Hong Kong by the Japanese was an orderly exercise. Here, the victors proudly ride through the downtown business area on horseback. Troops overran a hospital in the same day in Stanley on the south side of the, here, down in here. Here's Stanley over in here, right there. And uh, the atrocities were carried out there by the Japanese. Troops overran a hospital, bayoneting doctors, wounded Canadians in their beds, raping and murdering the nurses. Defending Hong Kong was a total disaster as we mentioned earlier, with all defenders killed, wounded, or captured. Now, ironically, the Canadians, who are now captured by the Japanese, were back at their old North Point barracks. They'd arrived there when they arrived a few <clears throat> months, a month earlier, and they now were prisoners of war of the Japanese. This photo, by the way, was taken just after the war because Picture taking by the POWs was uh, forbidden on pain of death or torture, so there was no photos. But that didn't stop this artistic talent. Some Canadian POWs went ahead and drew pictures, and here we are, a uh, smuggle drawing of the notorious Sham Shu Po camp in Kowloon. This is Argyle Street Camp, and another secret drawing. It's interesting because Here's a, here's a guard up here, and for some reason, he's not able to see whoever's doing the drawing, but he could have done that afterwards, I guess. Now, if caught, the punishment for this artist would have been severe, because cruelty of the guards and their superiors was normal. Typical of the debilitating physical conditions of the men who survived the terrible camps is this photo, which was taken after they were liberated. <clears throat> 
Now, my family connection to the Battle of Hong Kong is through a relative. His name was Ian Brakey. Now, he was from a small paper town near Quebec City called, interestingly enough, Brakeyville. I, too, was born there. Uh, he was a lieutenant in the Royal Rifles of Canada, and after the loss of Hong Kong, everyone, everyone wondered if he were still alive. Well, he was. But no one knew that until this telegram confirmed he was a prisoner of war. Word of his fate was sent in October 1942, 10 months after his capture in December of 1941. It's pretty bleak, as you can see. Whoops. Uh, it's uh, official information received from Tokyo, Japan, through the International Red Cross, Geneva, <clears throat> that Lieutenant Ian Brakey is a prisoner of war at a Hong Kong camp. Stop. Further information follows when received. Well, nothing really was received later, till long after. But they were able to exchange letters or notes. And here's one. This is between Ian and his wife, Hazel. This brief note from his wife tells about the family and winter driving conditions. It's dated March 1944. I get the sense, I've never been told otherwise, but I get the sense that they had to really keep the information very, very minimal. And I suspect that the written letter was actually transposed into uh, printed ways in this way by the censors or the people who investigated the letters. Ian replied right away, but a full 10 months after Hazel had sent her letter. So each was in bold letters, as I say, with minimal information. Now, Alan Brakey, Ian's son, has told me that his father was deaf in one ear for the rest of his life after spending nearly four years as a POW. But he did feel himself very lucky to be able to return in pretty good health. He went to Hong Kong at the age of 32, and he died at the age of 83. Now, not so fortunate was this man, Sergeant John Payne, a Winnipeg grenadier. He had some ideas about getting out of there and escaping the place. He and three others decided to escape from the North Point camp, but they were caught. And next morning, each man was beheaded by a Japanese officer. This man here, Ken Cambon, Ended up as Professor Emeritus at this university, by the way. This man was a survivor and, like all fellow POWs, was not well nourished at all, as you can see. He was sent to Japan to dig coal in the mines at Niigata and work in the shipyards at uh, Yokohama, I think, or near there. Their diet was terrible. They suffered dysentery, beriberi, and diphtheria. Many went blind. The red cross above Ken's heart indicates that this, oh, sorry, right here, that indicates that he was a medical orderly. In his, uh, this is meant, in his book, A Guest of Hirohito, and we've got a copy here, I'll show you, Kanban believes he wasn't sent to the coal mines because somehow he convinced his Japanese captors that he was a medical student and he would care for the sick POWs. But Ken told me, I got to know Ken quite well before he died, and he told me that uh, he was such a slightly built man, he knew that he would never survive uh, working in the coal mines, given the type of food they were eating and everything. He thought he would maybe last a month or two, maybe. So very smartly, he was able to convince the Japanese that uh, that was not for him, and they went along with it. Now here we have post-war photo showing a much happier Ken welcomed by home by his family. As you can see, everybody's smiling, they're very happy. Now, he later did study medicine. He became a doctor. He studied at McGill, became a doctor, practiced in Vancouver, and was a professor emeritus here at the University of British Columbia. Ken died at the age of 84. This man is a very fascinating person. After Japan surrendered on August 15, 1945, this man, Lieutenant Commander William Lohr, led the first contingent of armed sailors into Hong Kong to free the Canadian POWs. He was born in Victoria, and at the time, the highest-ranking Chinese officer in the Royal Navy, 
He had been seconded to the Royal Navy from the RCN. Interesting man. He died not too long ago. Great fellow. I didn't personally meet him, but I know a lot of people who did, and they had tremendous admiration for him. Ironically, uh, no, I should say, Japanese officers handed over their swords to li their armed liberators, and they now were captives themselves. This is a pretty dramatic picture. As you can see, there's the samurai sword that he's giving to, I don't know what rank this fellow is, but he's got a sidearm right there, not taking any chances, I guess. Now, ironically, HMCS Prince Ro Robert, <coughs> excuse me, which had delivered the troops in 1941, returned to Hong Kong to pick up the liberated Canadian POWs in 1945. I had a relative as, ma as well who was a, a sailor aboard this particular ship. Commander Day, he was captain of the Prince uh, Robert, and here he is right here. He, uh, he's surrounded by very, very happy Canadians on their first day of freedom, and all of them very anxious to get home. None of them look in great health, but there you are. It wasn't long before they got their wish, and in a few weeks, HMCS Prince Robert steamed into BC waters, dropping off survivors first at Esquimalt, then passing under Lionsgate Bridge into Vancouver. The surviving grenadiers, rifles, and numerous other army units were eventually back on Canadian soil and very happy about it. Now, while the survivors had left Hong Kong and the POW camps behind, their comrades would forever rest here at beautiful Saiwan Commonwealth War Cemetery. on the mountainside uh, above Hong Kong. This uh, photo here that we've put in, the, that is the Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery at Stanley. And there in that, and that's on the south part of the island, there we have about 30 Canadians and nurses as well who were killed in that uh, atrocity at the hospital I mentioned earlier. It's a lovely spot, this here, very lovely. And these buildings, of course, <laughs> it's typical of Hong Kong today, but the early pictures show there's no buildings there. <laughs> uh, but it's a lovely, lovely spot and very, very peaceful. In the colony, less than four years later, the tables had now been turned. Here, the enemy commander is signing Japan's surrender. And you'll notice over here, carefully watched, by a wary soldier armed with a machine gun. Looks like a Thompson machine gun, actually. I'm not sure that, that was necessary, but there it is. Japanese prison commanders and guards suspected of war crimes were rounded up. We don't know who, specifically who these people are, but I can tell you this. It included a man by the name of Kaneo Inuyi, he was nicknamed the Kamloops Kid by the Canadian POWs. Inuyi was born in Kamloops. He went to school here in Vancouver, then to university in Japan, and was later called up by the Japanese army in 1942. Because he could speak perfect English, they decided to send him to the prisoner war camps in order to deal with them. Inuyi claimed that he was persecuted while he grew up in British Columbia, which is entirely likely in that particular period. But he took out his revenge on the Canadians under his control by torturing and beating dozens and dozens of them as time went on in the three years or so that he was in charge. Two years after the war, Inouye was tried and hanged in Hong Kong for 22 proven war crimes. This image of newly liberated Canadians from a concentration camp is seared in the memory of those who survived and their loved ones. This is a very famous picture. Today, there are only 18 survivors, 18 survivors of the Battle of Hong Kong still alive, all of them in their 90s. Now we talked a bit about what was happening. Here's a great uh, drawing of a typical infantryman of that period. He could have either been a grenadier or a royal rifle. 
About 290 Canadians were killed in the battle itself, and close to 270 died as POWs. No fewer than 96 decorations were awarded to Canadian soldiers, including that one Victoria Cross. As author Nathan Greenfield has written, Hong veterans fought a third battle, this time with their own government. They wanted restitution. But it wasn't until 1998 that Ottawa agreed to pay $24,000 to each living Hong Kong veteran or surviving spouse for their forced labor under inhumane conditions endured as Japanese POWs. Then in 2011, the Japanese government formally apologized for, quote, the tremendous damage and pain to Canadian former POWs who have undergone tragic experiences in the camps both in Hong Kong and Japan. Pardon me? $24,000 each. No, I mean the Japanese government. No, no. That's another point, a good point. Uh, yes, the Japanese did not. Um, in 2000 and, wait a minute, sorry, yeah. 2009, a memorial mall was dedicated in Ottawa, the unveiling witnessed by Hong Kong survivors, their families, and friends. It acknowledges all the Canadians who took part in the Battle of Hong Kong and its aftermath. Now, the top of the wall, as you can see here, is rather interesting. It's a dramatic reminder of those mountains, which all of them had to climb at one point or another, that mountainous island that they were sent to defend. I'd like now to uh, acknowledge <coughs> some of my sources for my information. One of them is a book called The Damned by Nathan Greenfield. I have copies of them here. I want to take a look. This, to me, is one of the better books that's ever been written about the Hong Kong battle. And it's the, the, uh, the area, the, the time of the period of the leading up to it, the battle itself, and the aftermath. Guest of Hirohito by Ken Cambon. It's here as well. I think that's out of print now, but you might be able to find it at McLeod's Books if you're interested. And Not the Slightest Chance by Tony Bannum. Tony Bannum, that book is an excellent book. For those of you who are really interested in the detail of the battle, Bannum's book is excellent for that reason. He lives in Hong Kong today. He's been there for at least 30 years, and he has become really the specialist on, on that whole battle and its aftermath and all of the memorial sites around the island. And the other one that I thought I, I got good information from was A Terrible Beauty by Heather Robertson. That came out some years ago, about maybe 15 years ago. It's an excellent book as well. These are all good source books. So I'd like to entertain any questions if you have any. One question over here from David. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and uh, I really do appreciate your interest in, uh, in this often forgotten chapter of Canadian history and military and political history. So let's give it a shot. Anybody? Uh, yes, Roddy. Uh, two points, right. both Government of Canada points. I have always been under the impression that the British government had really pushed Mackenzie King into sending troops, whereas you're saying the, the move came from Ottawa that he was offering. Is, is that, did I hear you correctly? Yes, but there's a bit of add-on okay. to that. And then the second question is at the end, why did Canada treat these people so deplorably until the late 1990s? What was going on there? Well, to try to answer this second question first, uh, I have no idea. But you know, I think it has to do with that was then, this is now kind of attitude maybe. It, it really was <clears throat> political will that had to make that happen. And the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association, which I'll talk about in a moment, it was, it pushed and pushed. It was made up, uh, Roddy, of <clears throat> the, the, the survivors' children or the men who were killed there, their children. And the HKCVCA is an extremely uh, aggressive, oh no, assertive is the best way to put it. I guess they could get aggressive from time to time if they wanted to. But they're a very assertive group, and I think they really made the difference in that regard. Now, the first question is with regard to the pressure. Now, initially, uh, 
Churchill didn't want to go for any of it. He didn't want any further uh, expansion, uh, expenditure of, of uh, materiel, men, and, and, and weapons. Because he knew instinctively that if Japan did declare war, uh, as he said, they wouldn't have the slightest chance. And he was correct, of course. But here's what happened. There was a, a man who was a Canadian-born British general who had spent time here. His name was Grasset, G-R-A-S-S-E-T-T. -T. <clears throat> and he, he was a great friend of Crerer, who at the time was the uh, chief of defense staff in Ottawa. And somehow, he was able to convince Crerer that if, if he sent some Canadians there, it would really help. And maybe it would succeed. Then he goes back to England and he starts talking to his military confreres. And this to and fro kept on. It was at the military level, not at the political level. That's the good, that's something we have to keep in mind. And ultimately, I guess Churchill said, well, okay, you know, whatever. Uh, it wasn't his business, really, because it was a Canadian decision. So Mackenzie King, you've got to remember, there was a lot of pressure from the public in Canada at the time to get our boys involved in the war. Because here, Australia would, had already been in North Africa, New Zealand was there, you know, and everybody was fighting. Now, we had, of course, a lot of our pilots were in the Battle of Britain in 1940. But it was the ground war that the public was really anxious about. All our guys were sitting in, uh, <clears throat> in England, sitting around waiting, twiddling their thumbs, getting into trouble, probably. I had a brother-in-law who was there. <laughs> and they weren't, being, uh, they weren't de being deployed anywhere. So it was an opportunity, if I can put it that way, for the government to say, hey, you know, we're doing something, and this is what we're going to do. It was, it was misdirected. There wasn't a lot of thought put into it. And in, in this book here by Nathan Gre Greenfield, he goes into that in some detail and makes a very, very viable case for the, for the bad decisions. And I hope that answers your question. Ultimately, the Canadian Army, Canadian military, uh, was able to convince Mackenzie King and his cabinet that this was a good idea. And we can do it. Oh, we've got two, we've got two regiments here. Unfortunately, they weren't very well trained. Uh, Brooke. Yeah, the army, uh, the occupying uh, Japanese forces, were they uh, regular army or were they, uh, uh, who were they? And, and secondly, uh, how were the, uh, the uh, Chinese and Hong Kong treated during the occupation? Because on one hand, uh, the Japanese have been fighting the Chinese, mm -hmm. and, and uh, on the other hand, there was probably a lot of uh, Hong Kong Chinese who were, in some respects, happy to see uh, Britain uh, sort of uh, overtaken yeah, in, yeah. On, their, on their island. Well, to go to your last question, I don't know how they treated them. I think there was variations on that. Uh, there's evidence that there was a fifth columnist in Hong Kong and Kowloon who were there to help the Japanese prior to the invasion and a number of spies. And as I mentioned earlier, they, they were able to identify a lot of good targets for the Japanese to hit, either through bombing or with artillery, when they finally invaded. And uh, so, you know, there was that aspect to it. Uh, I don't know that uh, there was resistance in the sense of the same as there would be on mainland China, because Hong Kong had been a colony for 10, 100 years, you know. So, in, in other words, they were kind of, they were, British citizens, more or less. So I, I'm not quite sure how that worked. Now, insofar, what was your first question again? Was uh, uh, oh, oh th whether the Japanese army was a regular or reserve? My my information, and, and you'll get this in the in the book by Greenfield. Uh, they were regular army, regular Japanese army. There was um, three uh, three di uh, three divisions actually. I mean, we're talking a large number of uh, troops. The, the, I said 30,000, but there's also figures that, that there was 40,000 sitting across the border waiting to come over. So when you look at that, uh, and you've got 15,000, more or less 14,000 defenders, not well equipped, guns pointing the wrong direction like they did in Singapore, all the rest of that stuff, uh, it was just a matter of time before they took it over. Wikipedia now, says 56, 56? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, I don't. Anyway, 
Um, my point is, is that um, they, uh, they, they, you know, the Canadians held out for basically seven days on the island itself. They didn't fight the Japanese in Kowloon or the New Territories. That was strictly a British show with two Indian, two Indian regiments. By the way, those Indian regiments were great. They, t they were tough and tough. The Royal Scots, not so much. Bad leadership, apparently. And uh, that's another story, but, uh, you know. So I don't know whether that answers your question. They're all regular force, as far as I can tell. I, I can help with that. Yeah, the go ahead. Um, I've read accounts, with, uh, I witnessed accounts from uh, Canadian troops that were stationed on Hong Kong Island before Hong Kong Island was actually invaded from Kowloon. The night before, when the uh, Japanese troops went into Kowloon, uh, the officers let them go on the population. Oh, yes. The soldiers could hear the screams mm -hmm. of, of the Chinese population being raped and killed. And they killed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds yeah. before they actually invaded Hong Kong. <clears throat> I didn't talk about that. Uh, I left that one out. I, I understood that. It actually gave them 24 hours. He gave his troops 24 hours to do what they wanted to do. And that's what happened. Yeah. Sad. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Dave? No, a question, a, a comment uh, um, on uh, the uh, resilience of the, uh, the fighting spirit of the Canadians. Towards the end, just before the surrender, I think it was at Chinese Gap, there was a platoon, just under a platoon strength of uh, Canadian soldiers who were uh, held one particular point. They still had plenty of ammunition and they still had the machinery. Uh, the Japanese had to take two British officers who had already surrendered up to that point uh, and ask these Canadians, order these Canadians, uh, to stop fighting. Mm -hmm. They were not going to give up. Yeah. They knew what would happen to them if they were uh, mm. taken prisoner, uh, and they were determined to fight. So they fought to the end. They wanted to fight to the end. Right. This is the area I think you're talking about down in here. The Royal Rifles finally had to surrender down in here. They were pushed, pushed, pushed. You see there? That's one company of Royal Rifles right on that small, little, tiny, tiny peninsula right there. And that's, I think, where it, where it happened, what you're talking about, David, right there. Stanley View, Stanley. Um, the hospital was right in here as well. That uh, cemetery is right there now too. But they had to, they didn't want to give up. Uh, very resilient and, uh, and courageous. I mean, you know, these are all uh, farm boys from the prairies basically, uh, needing work, joined the army. And by the way, they were very good shots because <laughs> they were always shooting gophers. <laughs> uh, no, by and large, Canadian army was, they, they were very good shots in terms of uh, you know, they, <laughs> they were good. Uh, and, uh, but that's, that's what happened there. When, um, when Lawson was killed in, up in here, he was shot up in here. Uh, I'm not sure what happened with the, uh, the Middlesex Regiment, which was a, an English regiment, is drawn in here, right in there. But my emphasis today was more on the Canadians as opposed to the others. But, uh, you know, they all... They all put up a good fight, but uh, unfortunately the Royal Scots had a bad rep there. I must say this, and you'll see this if you read any of these books, uh, the British High Command didn't have much respect, shall we say, for the Canadian troops, uh, either when they first arrived or even after they left. Uh, no war diaries were kept, which is very unusual, but the reason they did that did not happen was because they were captives of the Japanese and they weren't about to allow the Canadians to write their war diaries, which is always a traditional way of uh, recording the history of a regiment. Uh, and uh, some of the higher, higher ranking British officers became very critical in later years after the war of the Canadian performance. But uh, as both Greenfield says, and so does uh, Bannum, they, uh, they were wrong. They were wrong. And uh, a lot of the survivors of, uh, who continued to live up, in three, right up until the mid-80s, uh, up to the 90s, 95, so, uh, they were extremely upset. And this is why the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association, one of the reasons why it was formed, to put the record straight. They've got a very good website. I'll just go into it here. Uh, I wanted to thank 
people. Alan Brakey, this relative of mine, he lives in Bragg Creek, he provided me with lots of stuff. Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association, and of course Chelsea here at the Rare Books, and my wife Christine, my partner. <laughs> and uh, I guess I don't have the website up there, but um, uh, I think it's called hkvca.ca. That is it, yeah. Um, and so uh, I wanted to remind you all that there are two more presentations coming up in this series. Uh, one of them, is, well, the first one will be, the next one will be on November the 8th. And um, Clifford is right here. Clifford, could you stand up and show everybody who you are? <laughs> and Clifford's going to be talking about, the title of it is Canada's Secret Sailors, the Asian Crewmen and Canadian Vessels in the Indo-Pacific Theater. And then on uh, November the 10th, uh, Thursday, uh, Cheryl Grace, Professor Emerita of English and University of Killam professor, will be talking about remembering the Great War, that's the First World War, with Canadian writers and artists. And that should be kind of an interesting one too. Um, as she says here, the write-up is, while Canada has been in surprisingly low-key about commemorating Great War since 2014, we do have a wealth of artistic material that does important work in reconstructing and remembering that war, and we have too. And uh, uh, Clifford's talk next week uh, is based on research gathered over the last two years uh, where he'll tell the forgotten story of hundreds of non-resident Asian seamen on vessels of the Canadian Pacific Railway deployed by the British Admiralty in the Pacific and Indian Oceans during the First World War. That's a great that's a great topic, Clifford. That'd be great. And again, see, these are stories that are not told. They're not that well known. And uh, this one here, yes, it's well known by a certain element of Canadian citizens, but by and large, it's forgotten. It's forgotten. And yes? I want to say your presentation was magnificent. Oh. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Mike. Oh, People yes, Fran. Hi, Fran. Yeah, hi. Good to see you again. Um, I was a child in the field when the soldiers were coming down. Oh, you, yes. Did you see them? Uh, they were pretty sick. Um, the uh, Asian ladies uh, met every train with any uh, returning soldiers mm -hmm. and uh, provided some good. Uh, Home cooking for them. Oh yes. But when the uh, the prisoners uh, came through the uh, 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 they were asked, "Please don't feed them. They've been starving." Yes. And uh, temptation was there. Just makes them sick. Yes, that's right. Uh, they had to be uh, very carefully dealt with in that regard. Okay. It, the that was a story that I kept reading about the survivors of the Holocaust who. Were, uh, were liberated, but many of them died very quickly afterwards because they kept eating so much food. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the same thing occurred with them. Yeah. Yes, uh, Chris. Cameron, you forgot or you didn't mention about your brother-in-law, your sister's husband, who was ready to go to oh, yeah. to go to uh, this war after he had been like, yeah. in Italy. Yeah. You know, what, uh, what Christine is talking about there is uh, uh, before, the, the, before the bombs were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, uh, there was a force being, being developed here in Canada to assist the Americans in the invasion of Japan. And uh, my brother-in-law, as it turned out, he had already been in Italy, and by then he had become, I think, a captain or a major at some point, and uh, he basically signed up for that for that mission. And he moved out here to Victoria. There was a lot of them came out to Victoria and Vancouver and were sort of being prepared to go and get onto ships and all the rest of it. And then, uh, as they say, the balloon went up and, uh, and the US Air Force dropped the two bombs. And within, well, two weeks after that, the first one was dropped, uh, 
the Japanese surrendered on August 15th, so my brother-in-law luckily didn't have to go a second time. But uh, that uh, would have been an incredibly, I'm being a little political here when I say this, but I, that would have been an incredibly difficult struggle to capture the home islands of Japan because <clears throat> as, as we've seen with Okinawa, the Americans lost nearly 60,000 men it just in that one island battle alone. Japanese probably lost a, double that number. But that's the kind of resistance they had to face. And that was just Okinawa. And, uh, you know, so it would have been an incredibly devastating uh, event had they, had they proceeded. And I'm so glad that he didn't go <laughs> uh, because he may not have survived. There's an enormous hospital, as you probably all know, in Honolulu uh, on the island of Oahu. Uh, and it's up on the hill, big, 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 huge hospital. It was built specifically by the American Army to deal with the casualties they were expecting after the invasion of Japan. Now that, that hospital uh, was used extensively, of course, during the Vietnam War, but it's just an example of how prepared they were to, to deal with the casualties they knew were coming. They just knew it. So big losses, yeah. Thanks for that. I, I should say that uh, my brother-in-law, who I'm now talking about, <laughs> he's dead now, unfortunately, but uh, he had two, uh, his two sisters married two men who went to Hong Kong, of all places. And luckily, they too survived. And uh, the daughter, one of them, lives in the seashell. Uh, both of these gentlemen are gone now. They, they lived into their 90s. Uh, good health, <laughs> up to a point. I wanted to mention earlier that, uh, that Many of these fellows were blind, and this was a, a, I was talking to a gentleman on, on Vancouver Island. His father was actually blinded, and luckily he was liberated by the American Army. They immediately took him into a hospital ship that was anchored there in Tokyo Bay, and uh, tried to treat him. They took him to Guam for a hospital there. He spent about five weeks. He got his sight restored. And, you know, it's all nutrition, right? I mean, and they, they, did, they did fine work with him, even in 1945. That was pretty darn nice. Now, a lot of the men didn't succeed in getting their sight back, but a lot of them did, thanks to the fast action by American mili military medical people. Mm -hmm. Did you have any more uh, background on the decision to send them and who was involved? And they were also the Minister of Defense at the time. Ralston, yeah. yeah but uh, I read the books. I, I didn't recall much from his time of anybody at his level being involved in the decision in well, 1942. Uh, they were more involved in what was going on. Yeah. Was that, how, was that purely a political part? You said it was an army thing, but that, in any of the army histories that I read, there was never a mention of that. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that was selective too. <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, it took place in 40, 41. There was a lot of uh, pressure from uh, citizens of Canada to, what are we going to do? I mean, we already, the Navy was struggling to get going on, on building ships and, and, and getting out there and dealing with the Battle of the Atlantic, ultimately. The, the Air Force was involved heavily. Our, our pilots were heavily involved with the Battle of Britain. And, and uh, I don't know where the bombing started at that, yeah. Anyway, um, so all of that was taking place, but ground troops were not yet involved in anything. And there was this tremendous pressure uh, on the part of the citizens and politicians to get, get going, you know, what can we do to help? And uh, I think that because of the Australia, because of the other Commonwealth countries like Australia and New Zealand, were involved heavily with the British in North Africa, for example. That kind of triggered that. I said earlier about the fact that it was a big push on the military. I'm still convinced that it was. I'm not convinced that uh, King and his people, because don't forget Ralston, if he was the defense minister, he was the member of the cabinet. It took the cabinet in, in Ottawa five days to debate this and decide. So it, it wasn't like a day's work. It was five days. And uh, somehow the... Uh, military um, brass was able to <clears throat> convince the government 
that these two regiments who were basically untested and, I mean, uh, that they were okay to send. You know, that, this is what really surprises me. I don't think there was sufficient questioning done insofar as military was told to do something and you know, all of us know military is, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, uh, let's do it. Uh, and there wasn't a lot of pushback. I think for whatever reason, I think the military uh, brass felt that this was the best thing to do. Realistically, I don't know whether they felt what the casualty toll would be. I don't even think they did projections like that in those days. May not have, you know. I don't know if that answers your question, but I have a feeling that it was the military that was uh, for it, and the whole idea was that the government said, okay, yeah, well, we're under pressure, we're going to do this. That cartoon I showed is a good example of that attitude, you know. We're going to intimidate those guys, but, you know, a very jingoistic approach, but there it is. It's war. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether I don't answer your question or not. Not really an answer, it's just more speculation. <laughs> well, I, I just wondered if you came to count the documents, but... Uh, I guess if, if somebody wanted to really study, they, they'd be released now. They could be released now, after 30 years, so... That would probably be pretty interesting to look at that. It would be. I, I have the opposite view to what you have. Mm -hmm. The Army guys, it's always the position if you're an Army officer and you're an Army, let's get into the action because that's, that's right. the only way I get a promotion. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Everybody comes at the, at the guy who's the unit commander, the regimental. Mm -hmm. Sure. Usually a lieutenant colonel. Yeah. No, I don't, disagree. I don't disagree with what you're saying at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just find that that's mm -hmm. you know, true because all the pressure was for action in England. Yeah. That's right. And there was no pressure to send on the military side to send people to the Africa, for example. No, no. And so I just have a yeah. strong defeat from what you have. Yeah. Well, that's fair enough. Um, and I could be convinced otherwise. Um, so you feel it was a political decision. Let me just simply say this is that one of the things that Mackenzie King did, uh, regardless of his reputation, how people feel about him, he, he stood fast against the British when they wanted him, wanted him to, to get Canada more heavily involved in a lot of things. And one of the things he came up with was called the Commonwealth Air Training Plan. And basically he said, this is going to be our contribution. This is going to be our major contribution. And it was enormous success. Some of my friends over here are, 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 were in the RCAF and they know what I'm talking about. This, this was one of the biggest advantages that Canada had in terms of the war. We had, as you well know, we had training, training uh, bases all across the country and everybody from England, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, they all came here to train to be pilots. And it was a tremendous success. And uh, that was a big contribution on the part of Canada. So in that sense, I know I'm deviating a little bit from this, but I think with what happened here may have motivated the, the political uh, decide, decision makers to move in that direction as well. So that you didn't have people on the front, but they were nevertheless a very integral part of making sure that our military, particularly our Air Force and our Commonwealth Air Force was well equipped and train properly to, to, do, to do the job, to finish that job. I, I know I'm deviating a little bit, but I don't think a lot of people realize that this was a, an enormous uh, commitment on the part of King and his cabinet. And he had to push back against Churchill and all the rest of them saying, you guys have got to get over here. He said, no, no, wait a minute, there's another way we can do this. Oh, and the other thing he did too, by the way, is that the Canadian government controlled this. It was not the British. And so that's, a, that's an important distinction. <laughs> uh, David. It would be interesting to know what the Canadian government's attitude was following the fall of Hong Kong and the battle and all yeah. the troops that we lost. But they still as keen to fight. I think they wanted to forget about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I say that in a cynical way, but, uh, you know, I, I think that's a fact. Uh, you know, and that's why, this, this is why this enormous struggle 
to get some compensation, to get some recognition. I mean, these boys, as Fran knows, I mean, she, she saw these men coming back. They were, they were terribly, terribly dealt with. You know, and no such thing as PTSD in those days. My, uh, my, my distant cousin, Ian Brakey, he says his dad uh, suffered from what they called nerve disease, whatever the heck that was. Well, that was probably what it was. Uh, he was deaf in one ear, uh, but overall he felt he survived. Uh, better than some. There's a gentleman in Victoria who is still with us, 93, 94, uh, blind. <laughs> All because bad nutrition. Yeah. So. Also, um, following the, in the 50s and 60s, that a lot of the veterans wanted to go back for the memorials. When they went to Hong Kong, they were welcomed and there were full military honors at uh, the, the various anniversaries. Yes. They were allowed consulates, they were allowed. Uh, Bugles and uh, bands and all the passports, the whole remembrance thing. And those same veterans wanted to go to the um, Canadian cemetery in Japan. The, can the Canadian embassy uh, told them that they were not allowed guns, weren't allowed to parade, if they wanted to take bugles, they had to take them in uh, plastic bags or paper bags. So, because they were frightened of offending the Japanese government. Yeah. Well, international politics changes a lot, a lot of attitudes, as we know. Um, this letter that the ambassador read, uh, and I, I just quoted a portion of it there, he says very clearly at the, at the outset in the letter that this is the apology letter. He says, you know, we're two countries who are peaceful and we, uh, we have a good relationship, etc., etc. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the reality of today's world, you know. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Sir.